A few weeks ago, we ran through the craziest F-15 Eagle variants ever proposed to the US Air Force, and you guys really seem to dig that list. So today, let's run through the even crazier variants of the F-22 Raptor that also could have found their way into service, as well as why they ultimately didn't. Let's talk about the wildest variants of the F-22 Raptor America could have gotten. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Today's video is sponsored by World of Tanks. Now, I love to learn and read about military technology, but sometimes at the end of a long day, all I really want to do is settle in with a good video game. And World of Tanks blends those two worlds together in a really fun way. This game is accessible to everybody, whether you're a novice like me or a longtime pro. Everyone can jump into this game and experience the same thrills as 100 million other players who all share our passion for this sort of fun and a bit of friendly competition. This game places an emphasis on historical accuracy to create authentic models and vehicle characteristics that make you feel like a real tank commander taking part and a furious armored offensive. You can earn experience, modify and upgrade your tank, and create a steel beast that's ready for any challenge. You can get in on the action on your PC by following the link in the description below, and I'll make it an even better deal for you. Use the invite code COMBAT to get a free seven days of premium access, 250,000 credits, the premium tank Cromwell B, and three rental tanks that you can use each for 10 battles, including the Tiger 131, T-78, and the Type 64. But hey, even if you're a returning player who just hasn't logged on in more than 30 days, you can get three days of premium access, the 2D-style bargain camouflage, a seven-day premium tank rental of a platform like the Centurion Mark V, or a 100,000 credit compensation if you already have that tank in your garage. If you like the kind of stuff we discuss on this channel, you'll probably like World of Tanks. So make sure to follow that link in the description and get in on the fun today. Lockheed Martin's F-22 Raptor is already widely touted as the most capable of all air superiority fighters on the planet, thanks to its combination of stealth, speed, maneuverability, and situational awareness. So, it seems pretty logical that this legendary platform would be the basis for more than one proposal for the development of new derivative aircraft for duties outside that air superiority role. Some of the platforms never came to fruition because there was no pressing need for their capabilities, or because cheaper alternatives were better suited to the financial limitations of a given program. But there's another important element to consider when perusing this list of dismissals. America was fighting a war on multiple fronts against opponents with no actual air defense capabilities and no actual air power to speak of. So advanced stealth platforms based on the world's most capable and expensive air superiority fighter just didn't seem like a prudent use of any sizable portion of the defense budget at the time. Of course, hindsight is 2020, and as the U.S. transitions back toward great power competition, it's certainly fair to say that some of these aircraft offered capabilities that Uncle Sam could really use in his hangars. But none of these platforms are likely to be pulled out of mothballs, however, for the same reason the F-22 program itself won't be. Because it's been more than a quarter century since the Raptor first took to the skies, and today it would cost about as much to restart Raptor production as it would to just build a newer and better aircraft from scratch. That's just how technology rolls. So, while some of the F-22 iterations or derivatives might be better than the platforms currently filling slots in Uncle Sam's fighter roster, it's important to remember that the Air Force's next-generation air dominance program is already progressing at full steam. And if it lives up to the hype, it should leave the F-22, as well as its hypothetical counterparts on this list, in the proverbial dust. But let's start with one platform that not only came awfully close to production, but the U.S. could genuinely use these days, and that is the FB-22, turning the Raptor 
into a fighter bomber. Now I record these first and then try to edit video after and I'm well aware of the fact that there is no footage to pull from of an FB-22 in flight because this aircraft was never tested. But I also know that I've flown lots of sorties in the FB-22 in Ace Combat 7, so bear with me, some of the footage will likely come from that. Lockheed Martin's proposed FB-22 stealth bomber, or Strike Raptor if you'd like to call it that, would have shared a number of components in common with its fighter counterpart, but would have added significant range and payload, as well as a second crew member at the cost of some of the Raptor's legendary aerobatic performance. The goal was to meet the Air Force's needs for a regional or medium-range bomber that could bridge the capability gap between fighter air-to-ground operations and long-range strategic bombers with heavy payload capabilities. The FB-22 leveraged large delta-shaped wings that dramatically increased lift and fuel capacity while offering more room for ordnance in an enlarged internal payload bay, as well as detachable stealth munition pods. Now that's something the U.S. still has a great deal of interest interest in fielding. In fact, today's F-22 Raptors are in the midst of a massive 11 plus billion dollar upgrade that includes, among other things, the low drag tank and pylon program, which aims to field stealthy underwing fuel pods to extend the Raptors' range. But those same pods could eventually be modified to accommodate munitions instead. And that could be a very big deal, not just for the Raptor, but for the F-35 as well. The FB-22 proposal estimated a maximum combat load of some 15,000 pounds of ordnance carried internally while maintaining a stealth profile, and maybe as high as 30,000 pounds while flying in beast mode or with external munitions when stealth wasn't a concern. But its real claim to fame had to be the capability to carry an estimated 30 to 35 small diameter bombs internally. And it could carry all that hate with a range triple that of today's F-22 at an estimated 1,600 miles unrefueled without external fuel tanks. And while it would have lacked a lot of the dogfighting prowess of today's Raptors, it still would have delivered a top speed of Mach 1.92, making it the world's only supersonic stealth bomber. A total of six different FB-22 variation designs were proposed to the Air Force as they tried to work out exactly what capabilities, performance, and range they wanted out of this platform. And ultimately, the Pentagon assessed that fielding the FB-22 would only cost about 25% that of developing and fielding an entirely new stealth bomber, making this FB-22 Strike Raptor seem like a real bargain. The proposal was so promising that in February of 2003, Air Force Secretary James Roche told Congress he intended to purchase 150 FB-22 Strike Raptors. And in 2004, Lockheed Martin officially presented the FB-22 to the Air Force to meet their requirement for a strategic bomber that could be operational by 2018. But the FB-22 program would ultimately fall victim to the same budget cuts as the F-22 Raptor program itself, ultimately getting the axe in 2006 as a part of broader cuts brought about by the global war on terror. But it is worth noting that the FB-22's cancellation ultimately cleared the path for today's B-21 Raider, which we likely would not be seeing in development today if the FB-22 had gone into production. All right, up next is an even crazier proposal known as the NATF-22, a swing-wing Raptor meant for carrier duty that if it had gone into production seemed destined to be in a poster on the wall of my childhood bedroom. You see, as the F-22 program matured, it impressed a lot of people, including members of Congress who pressed the Navy to consider adopting a swing-wing variant of this fighter under the NATF, or Naval Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, that began back in 1988. In order to make the F-22 suitable for carrier duty, Lockheed Martin would have had to incorporate a number of significant changes to the Raptor design. Alongside the usual changes one can expect out of a carrier-capable aircraft, things like a strengthened fuselage and an added tail hook, the naval variant of the Raptor would have incorporated a variable sweep wing design similar to that employed by the Navy's existing F-14 Tomcats. It's like they invented this whole concept just to make me giddy. I don't care if it's impractical, I want it. But to be clear, it was very impractical. 
The addition of those variable geometry wings, perhaps more than any of the other changes, would have been a massive challenge for engineers to contend with. Stealth fighter designs take great pains to eliminate any seams or gaps between body panels, as even the smallest gap can ultimately produce a radar return that compromises the aircraft's stealth profile, and as you might imagine, it would be all but impossible to eliminate seams and gaps from variable geometry wings, which by their very nature require some amount of gap tolerances to allow the moving components to move. Ultimately, this concept just never quite made it off the drawing board, despite how insanely rad it could have been. The Navy, for some reason, opted to prioritize actual combat capability over the unbridled awesomeness that could have been an F-14, F-22 hybrid fighter. I know, it pains me to my core, but it is what it is. All right, let's move from the craziest proposal to the most down-to-earth, the F-22B that would have let you fly the Raptor with a friend. Back during the Raptor's development cycle, the Air Force was not only on the market for single-seat fighters. In fact, when they first gave Lockheed Martin a contract to produce prototype aircraft, that contract called for seven single-seat iterations of the aircraft, known as F-22As, and two twin-seat versions known as F-22Bs. Now, there are a number of good reasons to build a fighter with room for a second occupant. A second seat can be handy for pilot training, but it can be even more valuable in combat, allowing you to distribute the cognitive load across two brains instead of one. This is the reason so many Cold War aircraft were two-seaters, like the F-14 Tomcat, the F-15E Strike Eagle, and even the SR-71. There is so much going on that you need to pay attention to while flying through contested airspace that there is a ton of value in allowing the pilot to just focus on flying the jet, paying attention to threats that may emerge, and keeping the crew alive, while the second-seater can focus on operating things like the radar, the weapon systems, the radio, and more. Today, the U.S. Air Force is actively developing what they call AI agents to fly alongside human operators in the cockpit of advanced new jets, allowing the pilot to distribute some of that cognitive load to the artificial intelligence flying on board with them. In fact, this year, as a part of Project Venom, the Air Force is adding artificial intelligence to five F-16s that will go on to fly combat exercises with real pilots on board to allow those AI agents to learn directly from real human pilots. But back when the F-22 was under development, that was all still science fiction, and the most logical way to distribute the load was to have a second seat. As you know, the twin-seat F-22B never actually did go into production, but if it had, it may have made the air superiority fighter a more promising option as either a medium-range interdiction bomber or even better suited for the attack role that fighters on board carriers have to fill. But that's a whole lot of maybes and ifs all balled up into that second ejection seat that never actually found its way into the aircraft. Okay, now let's close with the most forward-leaning F-22 variation ever proposed. In fact, it was so forward-leaning that it even came with a new name and designation, the X-44 Manta. Way back in 1999, Lockheed Martin had a plan to use the F-22 as the basis for a new Delta-winged stealth fighter that skipped the need for a conventional tail section, and they called this platform the X-44 Manta. Now, the Manta was not aimed at active service, but was rather aimed at producing a viable technology demonstrator for the next generation of fighters to come. The premise will likely sound pretty familiar to those of you who've been following the Air Force's ongoing Next Generation Air Dominance program. Put simply, by eliminating those standing vertical tail surfaces, the result would be an extremely stealthy platform, not just against the high-frequency targeting radar arrays that today's stealth fighters are designed to beat, but also against low-frequency early warning radar arrays that can sometimes produce a resonance against today's stealth fighter designs. Now, these low-frequency arrays cannot guide a weapon into a target, as we've discussed on this channel before, but they can be used in conjunction with high-frequency arrays and some advanced air defense systems. Basically, that low-frequency array just tells the high-frequency one exactly where to aim, so the minute that stealth fighter finally does come close enough to target, 
that targeting array is already all over them. Now, the X44 program aimed to offset the loss of that tail through advanced 360-degree thrust vector control, or the ability to orient the outflow of the engine's thrust independent of the airframe. Today's F-22 Raptors already have thrust vector control, but it's limited to orienting the thrust of the engine about 20 degrees up and down. Now that allows for a high degree of control while flying at a high angle of attack or while flying at extremely high altitudes where the air flowing over the control surfaces just aren't as effective. But with even more advanced 360 degree thrust vector control, the aircraft could perform even greater aerobatic maneuvers. And it stands to reason that that could help offset the loss of control delivered by omitting those tail surfaces. And in fact, this is a question we have today about the sixth generation fighters currently in development because all of the renders that we've seen so far also omit those standing vertical tail surfaces. At least when we're talking about American sixth generation fighter proposals. Some proposals out of Europe, like the FCAS and Tempest, do seem to show at least some sort of traditional tail. Ultimately, the X-44 Manta never manifested to answer these questions for us, or at least not to our knowledge. Today, Lockheed Martin and Boeing are the final two competitors in the Air Force's Next Generation Air Dominance program that aims to field a replacement for today's F-22 Raptors, and elements of that X-44 Manta program are all but certain to be found in Lockheed Martin's still-classified proposal. Now, the contract for NGAD is expected to be delivered this year. So maybe we will still get to see some variation of this X-44 concept if Lockheed ultimately wins the contract. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure to swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.